Hello, everybody, and welcome all thanks to LD Mobile. This is NBL Overtime. Hashtag NBL Overtime to get involved wherever you might be right across the world as we fire into what's going to be a big show. I know there is one particular young man that has homicide up and about. We'll get to that very shortly. We're going to talk about opening weekend because this would be opening weekend in a, in a normal world. And, of course, yes or no. Homicide, hello to you. That is, you look sharp. That's a freshly pressed brand new shirt, is it? No, it isn't. <laughs> oh, it looks it. <laughs> Nappy Sands working a treat. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing well, man. Oh, look at this guy. He looks 25 years younger. Liam Santa Maria's had the shave. <laughs> I'm just trying to balance things out, mate. And I can't get to the hairdresser at any stage. So I'm just trying to, I'm doing the, like the anti-LeBron. Yep. You know, and so I'm balancing it out the other way. Beautifully done. Let's get into it because we are joined by a very special guest. Of course, the Tasmanian Jam, uh, Jack Jumpers, which... We're going to get stuck into a couple of things, but firstly, the CEO, Simon Brookhouse, joins us. Uh, Simon, welcome. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me, guys. Very yeah, exciting it, times. It is. There's, there's a couple of things we want to get to firstly. That was quarantine, mate. When you get a new job as exciting as this, and they're like, hey, you got to sit in a hotel room for a couple of weeks, though, mate. How'd you find it? <laughs> oh, it wasn't too bad. I, I went in pretty well prepared, given coming out of Victoria, we're almost in quarantine anyway, so... Yeah. Uh, and I did have so much to do that, you know, all jokes aside, the time went pretty quickly. So um, there's a lot to prepare for, and I filled the days really well. Before we get into the nitty and gritty, I just want to ask you personally, of course, you've been an administrator for, you know, so many of these top sporting governing bodies around the country. What, what, what attracted you to this job? What, what was it that made you think, hey, I want to apply and, and give this a real crack? Well, I think it's the excitement of something new, uh, building something from scratch in a state that I love and a state that also has been yearning for a national team that will end up being on the global on the global stage. So combine all that together and, and knowing how strong in basketball Tasmania is and the support that I thought we'd get. And uh, so far, we haven't been proven wrong. Everybody's got behind it. But it really is that challenge of growing something from scratch and, and making it successful. Big step a few days ago, Simon, with the, uh, the, the announcement of the name and the colours and the logo, the branding, all of that, the Jack Jumpers. What, what, what is it that you like most about the name? I like the fact that it's different and it's got everybody talking. I think those two things are really important. I think, yeah, you know, I, I'm not adverse to some negativity around those sort of things. I think that creates, um, it creates a rivalry already between Tasmania and certain people on the mainland who weren't uh, all that, uh, I guess, enamoured with the name. Um, but look, it also, when you look at, when it's brought to life that sort of marvel superhero type character that the kids love it and we want to be a really family friendly club and an exciting club around basketball and i think when you can you combine all of that it's a creature that's synonymous with tasmania one um two it's a, a proud feisty little bugger that really um excites people and and three the kids just really love it they love the character that is the jack jumper and i think you put all that together um, and I've said it down here, when you come to Tasmania, you don't forget it. When you come across a jack jumper, you don't forget it. <laughs> and I think we can live by that. What was the first thing you had to do outside of the logo and the name? What's the first thing up that you have to do for this organization? Yeah, look, I, the first thing is really solidify the off-court staff. Um, there's a lot of little things, administrative things and getting offices and all of those. But from now on, in terms of basketball, we need to start looking for a coach. Uh, we need to start looking for some assistant coaches to get the ball rolling and any possible marquee players. Um, but in terms of, you know, building relationships within the community down here, having coaches and, and people involved at least gives us something that you can hang on to. Um, and we can start building programs for schools. We can start building programs for coaches and developing them and those sort of things. So I'm really keen over the next month to really go down that path of trying to find a coach. Um, and if not, at least getting some quality assistant coaches who can start the ball rolling. How many head coaches have put their hand up already to you? Because I'm sure <laughs> your phone is ringing off the hook with agents, coaches directly getting at you. Yeah, look, it's been mainly agents, to be fair. I remember when the announcement happened and uh, LinkedIn went off. Um, I think I had about 500 LinkedIn requests from people I'd never heard of. <laughs> um, or with a basketball resume, whether it be a player, a coach, assistant coaches from anywhere from, you know, Lithuania to the US. And, uh, and, and that's exciting. It, it means that people are interested. But I think that, you know, genuinely there's been a number of uh, managers reach out about Australian-based coaches and there's been a few uh, reach out about overseas-based coaches. But uh, we'll start that process now of considering who's best, a best fit for down here. 
So just on that, Simon, when you are structuring up your, your basketball department, you obviously got the coach and the assistant coaches, as we know of, but are you putting a GM in? Are you going to put a you know, head of basketball? How does, how does that kind of work? And who is kind of helping you with those decisions and, and, and the process towards it? Yeah, look, we'll structure it up. Um, we've got a GM of operations already in place and a GM of commercial and marketing, which I think are the two most important roles yep. outside my own. Um, we've appointed a membership and community engagement manager who'll start in a couple of weeks. And we've also appointed a sponsorship servicing manager as well. So we've got five key people, but in terms of the actual basketball operations, we'll probably run that between myself and the operations manager, GM, um, with the strength of the coaches. And, and then we'll look to strength and conditioning and those sort of things. So um, we'll evolve. I've said all along that what we look like today probably won't be what we look like in 18 months time. We'll, we'll work out what's the best fit, but in terms of help, I've I got to say all the other clubs have been great. I've spoken to a number of the other club CEOs and what they've learned, what, what hasn't gone so well, what's gone really well. Um, Larry's obviously been well involved with clubs and, and the league and, and the support from the NBL league themselves has been fantastic. So they've really been really, really helpful. Yeah, the other clubs will change, mate, when you try and poach one of their marquee <laughs> players. You can bet on that. But uh, great news so far, Liam. <laughs> Simon, just, just back on the, uh, the head coach and, and that process, have you got a sense of what type of head coach or uh, that you might be looking to bring in, where you might be looking to bring that person in from? Because over recent times in the NBL, we've seen a variety of different looks, right? Southeast Melbourne started with a, an experienced assistant. Um, there's obviously guys like maybe a guy like Anthony Stewart, a Tasmanian who's never coached in the league before. Cool. And then you've got other guys like Rob Beveridge or Paul Hanare, these guys around the world who have already coached in the league. And, and also... New Zealand have brought in someone from, mm -hmm. from well and truly overseas, as have Sydney. Yeah. What, what are you thinking in that regard? Look, I think at the moment we're thinking all of the above uh, and we'll work through that. But more importantly, I think being a startup, it's important that we get a coach who sets the culture of what we want to be about. Um, Tasmania is a place that needs you to be involved and engaged with the community, probably more so than some of the other bigger cities in Melbourne. Um, there's no anonymity down here. The coach will be well and truly a prominent person. Um, so he wants someone who acts and, and, and delivers the beliefs and the, the values of the club. And, and, and a real big part of what we're trying to do down here is work with those NBL, NBL1 clubs and basketball Tasmania to actually grow the sport, not just be about the NBL team. Um, we want to win games, don't get me wrong. We want to be really successful. But being successful is also a measure of how many more kids are playing the game down here and, and how many development pathways we can create for future athletes. Uh, I think we all realistically know there's not that many Tasmanians floating around in the NBL at the moment. Um, so the coach is an integral part of that. So it's as much about what culture they bring and what leadership they bring. And I want them to be able to deal with the, the lowest common denominator being the four-year-old kid who wants to be a basketball junkie and the highest paying sponsor. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be someone who's, you know, a good, a good people manager and who's humble. Um, I don't think it's a good thing to come into a new state with a new town and, and be a bit over the top and, and too arrogant for what we need. So um, those qualities could come from anywhere. Assistant coach, US, current NBL coach. And I think we'll just work through that process. How have you seen the growth of this league? Cam obviously mentioned the experience that you've had mm -hmm. with a bunch of different, working in a bunch of different sporting codes. How have you seen the growth of the NBL in the past few years? Oh, I think it's unbelievable. I think it'd be fair to say that there isn't another sporting league in Australia that's growing at the same rate. Um, I, I think, forget COVID, pre-COVID, if you look at um, NRL, AFL, uh, A-League, even netball, none of them are growing with the same extension and expansion that the NBL is. Um, they put a new team in. Fantastic. You know, they put a team in a state that's been yearning for um, notoriety on the Australian, on the Australian land, uh, landscape. So I think that, you know, all the metrics show that it's growing better than any of the other leagues. And, and I think that's a testament to the team and to Larry and the investment that's got into it. And the fact that now we're, we're being said in the same sentence as the NBA is the, the possibly the second best domestic league outside the NBA um, shows that, you know, everything they're doing, they're doing really well. With we, we East Melbourne Phoenix, we did see, without remembering the exact timeline, but Mitch Creek was signed, of course, as a marquee player a, a long way out. Now, there was some clauses in there if you ended up being an NBA and, and all the rest of it. But COVID's probably changed it just a little bit for, for you guys because there are a lot of NBL clubs who aren't really overly certain as to 
how they're going to fill a couple of import spots and when the season all goes. Has that complicated it much from your point of view when it comes to getting your player, or at least the guy or a couple of guys you want to target? Sure. Look, I think it's it, it's complicated, but it may have helped it as well. I think that there's probably a number of players overseas who are seeing Australia as a pretty good place to be in the COVID world. So um, in terms of next NBL season, that complicates it a bit for us if it's extended. and We'll have a short lead time before the next season to get mm-hmm. players in. Um, and when that free agency window opens, that might be different to when it normally would be. But I think for us, in terms of the Mitch Creek type scenarios, if we can sign, uh, you know, a great Australian athlete who's playing in Europe or playing in college or in the US or even Asia at the moment, um, who we don't have those embargoed restrictions that the NBL have in place, um, that would help us. Um, And and we'll start looking at that now. We'll start sort of trawling who's out there who may want to come home. Um, I'm not sure exactly who at the moment, but there is a, a bit of a feeling around the world that, you know, it's not a bad place to be. If I can get a good contract in any sport, not necessarily basketball, and come back to Australia to play, um, people may be more willing to do that. The the other guys that um, may not be out of your reach during this season uh, are some of the guys I wrote about recently, some veterans of the league who are just kind of getting squeezed out of the con- the compacted rosters this sure. year. Guys like Dave Anderson, Alex Pledger. Do, are these types of guys... Uh, guys that you'll be interested in early doors? Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're, we're keen to look at anybody who's available um, because that's the reality for us. The, the, the other teams were pretty smart when, when they announced the new team. They all signed the, the Tasmanian players for a bit longer than normal. So uh, <laughs> we'll work with that and, and we'll work with anybody who's out there if there's an opportunity to talk to somebody. It's going to be exciting for the next 12 or so months before the Jack Jumpers take the court. But there's a lot to happen between that and a huge part of it. And the Derwin Entertainment Center, which oh. us three and, and a lot of people got to see firsthand oh. last year at the NBL Blitz. But the excitement around the, the refurbishment, the renovations, and not only what's going to happen on court and within the building, but also in the vicinity around it. Just talk us a little bit through that of, uh, I guess, the makeup of what it's going to look like in, in a not too distant future. Yeah, look, I think that's a really exciting part of it. And, and part of my role is looking after the Derwin Entertainment Centre going forward. So it's a, a great opportunity that, you know, there's a $70 million investment going into the stadium alone and a refit, which will start hopefully in the next couple of weeks. And they tell me it'll be finished by August. Um, fingers crossed. Uh, it gives us a bit of breathing space because we won't start till October, as you said. But um, but then the retail precinct and the restaurants and bars that, that Larry envisages and wants to put in there and, Further to that, there's the you know the plans for a hotel on the site, and then using the the Doon Entertainment Centre as a first class function centre as well, which 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 Hobart and Tasmania probably needs. Um, but then linking with someone like Mona just up the river, and, and being able to do things with the, the prominent, probably the most prominent tourist attraction in Tasmania now being mm-hmm. Mona, and, and they've been really open to to what we can do together. Um, there will be a long term ferry port there, um, so people will be able to come from Hobart, jump on the ferry you know, come to a game and then, then go home on the ferry again, I think it's fantastic. And that's that's probably a, a treat that not many basketball fans will get to do. So we've got a luxury of being able to do something a bit different. Definitely going to be beautiful. I can't wait to get down there. Hopefully I am, I will have a chance to get back down there. Tasmania is beautiful. I was, we were there for the Blitz. Yeah. My first time in Tasmania and I was blown away by the views and mm-hmm. the greenery. So um, I wish you the best of luck. Um, I love the logo. I love the team. I'm excited for everything that's in store for you. And good luck. Thanks very much. We're looking forward to the journey and it is exciting. That's the main thing. And we want to be exciting too. So we can't wait. We can't wait to get going. Simon, good luck. Congratulations on the job, both personally and also the job you've done so far, mate. And, and no doubt we'll have yourself or someone very prominent from the Jack Jumpers very shortly on NBL Overtime as they are announced, mate. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Jets. Appreciate it. Cheers. Now, if you've been living under a rock, you would have missed the Jack Jumpers and the video and everything about it. If you have missed it, which I can't believe you would have, but if you have, check this out. From below the earth of the island state comes a mighty new force. Fierce in spirit and feared by many. Introducing the Tasmania Jack Jumpers. Swarming the lead, backed by an army of 500,000 Tasmanians. They'll strike fear with their venomous attack and brutal defense.
The Jack Jumpers, the pride of Tasmania, are ready to loom large on the world stage. This is the day we've all been waiting for when Tasmania marches as one. Get ready for the spectacle. Get ready for the unexpected. Get ready for entertainment of epic proportions. The Tasmania Jack Jumpers march to the top begins now. Join the march today. Oh, that, there it is. There it is. If you want to get involved, and I know there are a lot of Tasmanians who are signing up, probably not even Tasmanians as only, but a lot of people jumping on jackjumpers.com.au, signing up, getting involved. And it's exci- it is exciting. You know, and I think Simon spoke well. He sort of said, no, there's always going to be negativity come towards these type of decisions and the announcements. But once the name is set in place, it gets more and more exciting each and every day. Jackjumpers.com.au. All right. Uh, was it you, Homicide, or was it you, Liam, who asked the head coach question? Liam kept doubling back, so I'm going to go to you first. <laughs> Where are you thinking? How do you think they should structure up personally about going and chasing a head coach for this crew? Well, as we discussed with Simon, there's a few different ways you can go about it. And I really liked his response, which is, well, from a, from a starting point, we're going to look at all those ways. Mm-hmm. You know, why put a red line through any of those potentials? You know, listening to, to, the, to what he laid out as the kind of guy with the kind of experience that they'll be looking for, guy or girl, um, I really feel like Rob Beveridge would be right at the top of the list in terms of a guy with championship NBL experience. He's out there. He's available. He's keen as mustard and he can do all those types of things that um, that Simon spoke about in terms of like being a presence out and about, taking clinics, growing the game in the state. So he would have to be well and truly a part of, of the process. But then, look, there are a whole host of other, other names. I mean, you would kick the tires on those guys that are currently overseas, right? Paul Hanare, Aaron Fern, Sean Dennis. You'd have those conversations, see where those guys are at with their contracts. You've got all the, you know, you've got a lot of um, options as far as assistant coaches around the league as well. I mean, I think two in particular, I think Judd Flavel at Southeast Melbourne and Adam Ford at Sydney will make great head coaches in this league. And you've got Jamie O'Loughlin and Scott Roth. And, um, you know, you've got some good options all around. So they've got a good, and then of course you can look overseas and bring in a Dan Shamir type. So a lot of good options to, to get the ball rolling. Some, someone you didn't mention there, although you're probably sort of half into that at, you know, I guess the search, Homicide, your former teammate, John Rilly, who you and I, Liam, had on NBL Rewind and, of course, in the collegiate system. That's a that's a that's probably a totally different idea in which has been done in the past, but is also a guy who you think, Homicide, considering, one, how he was as a player, and two, what he's been able to do since, he'd be a nice addition both personality-wise, which Simon did allude to, and on court as well. Look, there's a whole lot of people that would put their hand up for this position, mm-hmm. whether you want to go with a guy with, with no head coaching experience, whether you want to go with a guy with head coach experience. I mean, everybody's going to want this. John Rilly, Anthony Stewart, Lenard Copeland, D. Mack. Uh, CJ. I mean, who? CJ Bruton. CJ yeah. Bruton. I mean, there's, there's plenty of guys that you can – flag you know it's just ultimately who's going to as he said Mm -hmm. who's going to fit the identity of tasmania who's going to be willing to do the things outside of basketball for the community that's going to be the biggest thing so i mean did anthony stewart doesn't he coach down there he does i mean he was my former teammate as well when i was with the crocs and stewie him and really oh my god the shooting contest and the trash talking those two guys used to go to the lengths of who's the best shooter blah 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 both of those guys man um, i could see anthony stewart to be honest with you because he's a native Jeez, imagine linking them up imagine really and, and anthony stewart coming back together and working together and, and and i think simon he did allude to it he sort of spoke about being out in the community as well and and you're going to be the face almost of the franchise in particular early on you're going to need a certain personality to be able to attract people to this new brand to this new team to this 
team that, you know, for the bet, what's it been, 25 years since we've seen a National Basketball League team in Tasmania. So uh, I, I think that a lot of what is going to be based on the coach could be and include what type of personality they have away from the court. A couple other names to throw out there in this conversation. Obviously, it's very early doors, so we can throw all kinds of names out there. Well, hang on. <laughs> Just before you go any further, you say early doors, but Simon made it fairly obvious there that, hey, they want to lock this in pretty quickly. So Yes, yeah, but so it's the start. That he has also made it clear in, in other chats that he's starting that this week. That they haven't really yeah, cool. looked Fair at enough. that. Yeah. They've been on the, on the process of putting the, mm -hmm. the front office together and the name and everything. So it's the start of the process. Any NBL team who's looking at a, a head coaching position, if they're doing their due diligence, they're placing a call to Matt Nielsen. You have to have that conversation mm -hmm. to find out where he's at. And he's got a great thing going over there in, uh, in the States, uh, in that San Antonio franchise with the Austin Spurs. But you got to have that conversation as well. Yeah. And uh, I'd be interested to see whether they place a call and have a chat as well to Marty Clark. Now, didn't have a really very successful time in Adelaide in his previous NBL head coaching mm -hmm. experience, but he's very highly regarded for the work he's done at the center of excellence is the director of the NBA global Academy there. And he's a Tasmanian. So if you're trying to add some Tas Taswegian flavor to the mix, um, I'll be interested to see whether they have a chat with him as well. Adam Caporn's another guy as well, who was pretty much in the mix for the Adelaide 36ers job uh, for this particular season. Now, and there was a school of thought that he almost had the job. It didn't turn out that way for whatever reason. So there are a plethora of people who you can call upon to have a crack at when we come to the head coaching role at the Jack Jumpers. One other thing I want to say about Rob Beveridge, um, he has shown an ability to do really well with less, mm. which is what you're going to have in an, in, a, in an expansion roster. This is just, just how it is. And especially, as he said, when teams are locking up guys on two or three years because they know the team's coming in. So... Um, I would think he would be a really interesting place to start, Rob. Yeah, hashtag NBL over time to get involved. Who do you think would be a great head coach? Obviously, a lot of talk already. Hey, you know what? If you've got someone left field, jackjumpers.com.au, hit them up via email and give them your suggestion. Who knows? All right, anything left on Tasmania before we move on? Something that did excite us all, in particular fans of the Sydney Kings. And Liam Santamaria has been alluding this for a while now on NBL over time. But Diddy Lazada is back it is official of course next star year number two we're going to start with you homicide because you famously talking tasmania threw the headset off and left the gym after he hit his eighth three in a game that we were commentating i know that the official announcement is going to get you off. listen man love diddy lazada great young talent he's an asset to the league he's an asset to the sydney kings it's great that he's coming back and I look forward to him having an even better year and a bigger impact for the Sydney Kings. There's nothing he can't really do on the floor. And for him to come back to a league that he is now familiar in and has been successful in, he's going to be even better. So I expect even more from him in the leadership tip off and on the court. You bang on. So excited to have Didi back in the mix. Um, and you talk about how he's going to be better. The, the main way really highly talented young players get better at this age is they get more consistent. Mm -hmm. And we saw, you know, you throw on the headset off. Oh, see, see, there see hey, Liam, there you go. He gets hyped. Go he on. uses the size 13 <laughs> Chuck Taylors and he boots out the microphone. <laughs> Size 14s. 14, hey, my come on, man. <laughs> uh, they get more consistent. Did you catch that? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Okay. Consistent and then you Corey's throwing the headset off because he hit eight threes in the preseason. Th then we wait a little while. Then he blows up again in uh, that game against Perth in yeah. Sydney. And then, you know, he had that big fourth quarter, that massive moment in, in, the, um, in the finals Here's against the Melbourne game one. Imagine if we see those types of performances on a much more consistent basis. And we are. Cam went early with the all NBL selection. Oh, hang on. I calm down. I was hey. in Vegas. I was in Vegas. I got caught up in, <laughs> in Sin City. <laughs> but I'm going to say it again and sometime soon. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> he is going to be awesome this season. A second year in the league, more comfortable is more comfortable with the league, but really comfortable with the, the organization. Coach Weaver, if you can stay on the floor. Missed eight games last year and was had a lot of games where he only played half a game because he had a little tweak here or a tweak there. 
Um, put up, what, 10 and 4 last season. Mm -hmm. Um, That's going to go way up. I asked the question of NBL HQ earlier this morning, can a next star, a guy on a next star contract, can he win most improved player? Because if he can, Didi is going to be well and truly in that conversation. And uh, I'm waiting to get a response. You haven't got a response yet. No, I got a a response as in I'll take that on notice and get back to you. This might be like the time that I changed the rules. (laughs) Remember I changed the rookie of the year rules on this very show a couple of years ago? Well, surely he can, right? I agree. I mean, he's surely you can. So if he, I mean, he's going to be the early... There's no restriction. It could Favorite. be any restrictions on most improved. Like if you had an import that averaged four points and you had no cash and you got him again and he averaged 25, he could win it, right? Well, ne- yes, but next stars is such a new thing to the league, right? So they're working out. They had to work out whether they could win rookie of the year and now they're working hey, out whether hey. this guy can win most improved. I'm taking well, the credit for that because we had an argument on this show saying, I can't see why they can't win rookie of the year. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, you can. Uh, well, I can tell you this. Yes. I'm going to tell you who's my early vote for rookie of the year. Hit us. DV for three. Dion Vasilevic. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you something, yo. Hey, Here we go. welcome to the party. Let me tell you something. This kid is coming in to light this league up. I'm telling you, I am not hype. I don't get too hype on people. We got, you guys know this. Pardon? I don't get too hype on people. <laughs> All right, go on. This, this kid, I believe, is coming in to light this league up. Now, you guys both will hype on this kid, mm-hmm. right? Remember in the beginning, you say he's mm-hmm. a three-point shooter. We know, you know, yep. he broke the record in Miami and Big mm-hmm. East. I said he's going to win this rookie guy. of the year. Yeah. You know I'm saying? saying? This kid is going to, Liam, you did say it. You did mm-hmm. say this is rookie of the year. I agree, my friend. This kid right now is working his behind off. And <laughs> listen, I had a conversation with the kid. Oh, here we go. Uh, here we go. Here, here we, we go. go. <laughs> and the energy, the energy that was transferred through dialogue. I am a believer. Just off the energy alone. Yeah. Kid's got great confidence. Yo. Yeah, he'll he'll make the All NBL All Quote First Team next year. Oh, you he'll, know he's Serbian too, right? You know he's he Serbian. It. <laughs> hey, I love it. You know, you already know where I'm going with this. Sniper, gun, Serbian sniper. So you know he's coming in locked and loaded. He ain't coming in afraid. That's the gun right there, man. He coming in lights out. Hang on, you can't call him the Serbian sniper. Haven't you already given that nickname to someone else in the league? Let me tell you something. Tell me a Serbian player that can't shoot. Oh, I, I, I agree. That because... is a universal code, my man. <laughs> Understand. Okay, That's so a universal I, code. Okay, just I just I just want to make sure because I was I didn't want you to give the nickname as you did to uh, Mirko Jerek last year and now Mirko, rip it off Mirko him. Vibes, he's a Serbian sniper as well. <laughs> okay, that is so universal get... code. All right. I've never seen a group uh, a na- a nation of ball players. That can shoot like they can shoot. New York City, we are known for ball handling and penetrating. Mm-hmm. Nowhere in the world that a group of players from a specific region can do what New Yorkers can do in terms of handling the ball and getting to the basket. Serbians, lights out, shoot. If they can't do nothing else, they could shoot the ball. Yeah, I hyped. And he's going to get a, a good yeah. fight. Bright green light off the rip <laughs> from Will Weaver. You know, the way he wants to play and his emphasis on shooting the mm-hmm. ball. You got Casper Ware. I'm hoping they're going to have a bigger influence on Casper getting inside the arc, off the mm-hmm. dribble, drawing some attention, kick it out. DD, DJ, Angus Glover, these guys ready to catch and fire. And he's putting in the work, DJ Vasilievich, right now. And this period of time, this period of time, this extended off season, some guys are going to be really putting in that work mm-hmm. and some guys are, are just going to be ticking things over. And it's really going to show when we roll that ball out on, on opening night and, and we see who's really been getting it done. And I have no doubt he's going to come in ready to go. Hey, and one more thing, guys. Um, back to Didi. He's going to be an even better pro with the time that he spent here 
and he's going to transition beautifully to the NBA when he leaves here. And I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you why. Tell me players that have played in this league and have transitioned to the NBA and have not flourished. It's only one player right now. And he's young. Played uh, two years ago with Sydney, right? Mm -hmm. That's the baby. Everyone else has transitioned and flourished into Mm -hmm. their role in the NBA. Mm -hmm. That's how you value a domestic international league. And that's why I say this is one of the best leagues, if not the best league domestic outside the NBA. They're here in Spain. That's it. I don't count Euro League because it's not domestic. It's the best teams in Europe from all over Europe combined. That's not a domestic league. NBL is domestic. So NBL and ACB, that's how you rate a league for me. And I'm just going to piggyback on that point, Corey, because Didi, he also has the game that will transition beautifully. He got game, he, well, he's got the kind of game where you can pit it, pick him up and put him on any pro team. Team in the world. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like there's, there are some guys with certain types of game that they're like ball dominant sort of players or they're this or they're that. And it's like, eh, actually, you know, we've, I'm not sure that's going to fit what we do. Diddy fits anything anyone wants to do. He plays the game the right way. He, uh, you know, he plays both ends of the floor. He plays well on the ball and off the ball. And um, he's just going to fit right in. So another year of development in the NBA is going to go over and he's going to be, He's going to be a big time ambassador for our league and, and the development you can get here, no doubt. Huge, no, huge news for the Sydney Kings. All right. One of you mentioned week one. It might have been you, Liam. We, uh, right now, we would be doing week one if we were living in a normal world. Unfortunately, we're not. But before we get into what we want to look towards week one of NBL 21, let's take a look back to see how it started 12 months ago. Welcome to the world, South East Melbourne, Phoenix. By Brisbane, and I think they've done a really good job of tidying up their defense. Lamello shakes one way, then the other, then the pass to Josh Boone, who wanted the foul. Matt took just 60% from the free throw line career, so it was no surprise to see him mix one. Here we go, Cotton pass, but misses the shot. Machado, beautiful bounce pass to the runaway Oliver Duncan. Likewise, at the other end, they let them play. Patterson early in the offense for three. He's a star. He is a super star. Oh, that United Southeast Melbourne Phoenix game to kick started. It was huge. It was a great weekend. But it leads me into maybe the most important thing I've done in the last month. Oh, God. Who to go to first here? Because I have a feeling <laughs> both of you are going to try and fight it out about what matchup we want to see. Come week one of NBL 21. Hashtag NBL overtime. Hit us up week one as we get into it, as we get closer to when this thing actually starts. Who do you want to see clash on opening night? Hang on. <laughs> oh, it's come up for me. No, go on. Uh, just <laughs> yell it out because I reckon you're both going the no, same. Co- Corey, Corey, you go. Just don't All take right. my pick. No, I reckon he's going to take your pick and I'm going to laugh. I would like to see the baddest man to ever touch this country. Baddest import, Bryce Cotton, and the back-to-back defending champs, Perth Wildcats, go against the team I believe they're going to face in the grand finals, New Zealand Breakers. Oh, you did go different. I like that. Okay, left field. Let's set the tone early. (laughs) Liam? Okay. Well, I know where you're going to go, Cam. Yeah, I know. so I went somewhere a little bit different. Okay. And I'm presu- I'm basing this on a presumption that we're not in a hub. Yeah. We're in home enough. arenas. Yes. All right. Let's bring the Brisbane Bullets. I mean, let's bring the New Zealand Breakers with Lamar Patterson yeah. into the armory. And let's get that going right from the very get-go. Off the top. Last mm. season, we had to wait mm. a while before Casper Ware came into town yeah. at Melbourne Arena. Don't let's not do that this year. Opening round, I want to see Lamar Patterson. I want to see the armory full. I want to see him giving it to Lamarvelous, who was good for him, but has left him. Yeah. And uh, let's let's get that cracking right from the start. I, I love that idea. I, I think that, and what I'm about to say, what 
is, is nothing new. I think I've pushed it before, but I love rivalry rounds in the first game of the years. I just like the idea. The fans are hyped. The intensity goes through the roof. And that's a perfect example. And I think that not just NBL and basketball, but I think a lot of governing bodies miss the mark because if you get six or seven weeks into this thing, now Sydney and Melbourne last year were different because they're both kind of highly rated. But, you know, one of these teams at, you know, three and eight and their finals year is pretty much done, then the game drops off mm -hmm. organically. And I think sometimes you can miss it from marketing. And it's in that exact theory that I always push that the two teams are playing a grand final should be the two teams who open the season. And that is in any competition around the world. And it very rarely happens. But, you know, Sydney and Perth, the way that it ended, I think maybe even adds a little bit of a, dy a dynamic idea to it as well. Because, you know, Sydney are like, well, we would have got them. And Perth are like, we had your beat. We were going home. And I know that, you know, 2020 hasn't been normal at all, but Sydney and Perth in Perth, of course, I think winning the premiership or the championship in this, in this aspect should be able to raise the banner opening night in front of, you know, 14,000 screaming red army. And then you've got the Kings who won a minor premiership are only two games away from hoisting the banner themselves down the other end, having to hear the, you know, the intensity and the screams and the, the jubilation coming from the red army. I don't think there's any better way to start a season. None. Throw that ball up and let him go. No, that, I love that, that idea of it. That would be a beautiful thing. Yeah. Because, you know, you can picture a couple of different ways that game plays out. The Kings drop the big and and Cotton goes for 40. Yeah. And, you know, we've got a whole bunch that we need to listen to from Corey. It, what about if Casper Ware comes into town and erases the memory of the grand final and puts 35 and, and 7 or 8 on the board? So I, I like that for sure. Wait, Another one just out of left field to throw in there. Yep. I know they're not the Magic. I know they're the Phoenix. It'd be nice to see Gorge go up against Southeast Melbourne early in this season as well. Mm -hmm. so I think Southeast Melbourne should host the first game against Melbourne United, as in over the weekend, and then jump on the road. And you're right. That could be another storyline. I, I know that it doesn't always work out this way, but if you can try and get 20 storylines out of week one and, and you then mold your fixture around it, that's the best way to start with a huge explosion, I think, to kickstart your year. Uh, rather than just be like, hey, you know what? You know, that team, we'll, we'll just put cans and they can take... Like, and then, then Perth, if they host it, can jump on a plane and go and take the cans, tie pans, and their fans in the... In, what do you call it? The snag, the snag house. Is that what we call it? <laughs> the snag, snag pit. Where the cans, tie pans are like... The fans are like, we were so close to making that grand final. Yes. Now we've got, to, we've got to deal with this crew. I know it's a decent trip from Perth to Cairns, but that's what I think players are going to have to kind of deal with in a condensed season so that's how i think we should be looking at week one marketing having a look at the storylines that come out of it and away we go i think if we if we're not in a hub i, I could see a situation where at least early in the season um teams are playing a couple of games over a weekend mm -hmm. in the same location against the same team no doubt so, for instance, wouldn't that be a nice way to tip things off in, in the opening round if Sydney came over and played a two-game series against the Wildcats mm. um, and just went whackety-whack on yep. Friday night and Sunday afternoon and um, those two teams going well, at it, that would that would be fun. It's kind of Major League Baseball style. You go and you have a series for a couple of have days. And, yeah, and then away you go. Like, that would be... And you're going to have to think of certain things we don't traditionally have to think about when we get to the new fixture and, and how long is the season going to run and all the rest of it. But, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm amped. I'm amped just thinking about it. We're going to sit on our hands almost for three months, but it is starting to build up. All right. Yes or no, Tom? You ready? Uh-oh. No. <laughs> Homicide. <laughs> Southeast Melbourne or Melbourne United? Both teams looking for pass first point guards. Should they be doing everything to try and recruit Scott Machado, considering he hasn't signed yet or hasn't at least been announced to Cairns? No, he'll go back to... No, uh, that's not the question. No. No. Okay. So they shouldn't be trying to get Machado. No, they would assume that Cairns would get them. Mm, okay. Hey, in Tasmania, what's more important in, in season one, Liam? Having locals and obviously have players that are coming off the island or winning? Winning. All-star game in Tassie. Corey, last week you blew away my hub idea, but should we have an all-star game in Tassie in yes. NBL 22? Yeah, there we At go. Arena now is too beautiful not to. Hey, Got to have an all-star game down there. The Sydney Kings import search. Is there a player currently quite close on their radar, Liam, that has NBA experience? Yes. 
Hey, Liam. Question is that? Of course, it has to be. This ain't a cupcake league. You can't come bring on, guys man. in with no NBA experience. And it's the Kings. If, come on, Cam. Hang on a sec. Josh Sean Tate played NBA, did he, before last year? No, but you had Bogut. And you had Casper. And you got Didi. Yeah, well, hang on. You just said to me, of course, you're going to bring for NBA experience. But you're not all NBA team with all of those guys with the NBA experience. And you got Brad Newley. And you got Kevin Lish. You don't need that import to have the NBA experience, but he has to be good enough to be on the caliber of NBA. That's a different. This year, no, you just changed, no, you've just this changed year, the argument there. You just year, changed the argument. There's no uh, Kevin Lish. So, yeah. of course, you're going to need a guy who's who has NBA experience. Come on okay. now. Corey. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. Liam. Go. Well, Go. no, Cam, I know, you were just you were throwing a dart at a board mm. in a broad way. But in specific terms, yeah. yes. Okay. Hey, Lee, uh, Corey, Liam would make a great gem of basketball for the Jack Jumpers, wouldn't he? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Are you interested in a role like that, Liam? Uh, my phone's on. Yes or no? Yeah. Yes. Hey, should we be, while I'm with you, should we bring back, I, I think the NBL Twitter posted this a couple of weeks ago, should we bring back ref cam? No. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, did that. Got Al Harrington on the footage. And that's, that's good enough. That's all I got. That's all I got. And I'm so glad you said no because I would have had to sit here and argue better for five or six minutes. I like the innovation. I just don't think it worked. But there you go. And well, I don't know where we're sitting. Homicide, any of them before we get out of here? No, I think that's it. I think we covered it all. Well, there's one thing we didn't cover actually. A couple of weeks ago, you both were looking dapper and you look great again, Homicide. And uh, both of you felt important to kick me because I was wearing a T-shirt. And I hadn't dressed up to the NBL overtime standards. And I took that. I thought about it. And then I ignored you. And then, Homo- <laughs> then this guy rolls up in a hoodie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm shouting out Greg Hire. Greg, Greg Hire, Stitch in Time. Give him a little shout, shout out to Stitch in Time. Well, yeah. Hey. I love, I love if we give shout outs. Shout out to Greg Hire. But you've got to, you've got to. Great work as logo. usual in WA. He's doing all right. I'll be, I'll be back in, I'll be back in a collar next week. Cam, I want to ask you, did you stay on your feet this week? Did I stay on my feet? Yeah, I did. When you were out and about and uh, I did. getting your jog on. I did, did not trip this week. I'm in, uh, I'm in a much better mood this week, exercise wise as well. Good news. Uh, we've got a love hate relationship exercise and that has lasted the better part of 35 years. Uh, but I'm just starting to enjoy it. Ever so, ever so slightly. We're out of here. Hashtag NBL overtime. Don't forget, jump on jackjumpers.com.au. Check it out. We've got plenty to get into. Big week ahead of us. NBL rewind in a couple of days. Liam and I will hook back up for that. Check out Gibbo's podcast tomorrow as well. And of course, you got an isolation conversation yet or we got to wait a couple of days before you announce it? Saturday. We'll roll that thing out on Saturday. Look forward to it. On that note, we're out of here. We'll see you next week. Peace.